call this, moving right back on into prayer, we're going to call this transforming power in prayer. Transforming power in prayer. Now, I've shared for a long time how important it is to meet with God. How important it is to present yourself before God. Now, there's a lot of people have a hard time talking to God. And I know this through the years. For example, I'll, I used to call on people and say, would you like to pray over the meal? And they'll say, uh, uh, uh. I want you to get used to prayer. Can you say amen? Used to talking to your Heavenly Father. Number one, he's cleansed you from all your unrighteousness if you have Jesus in your heart. That means that he doesn't look at you through guilt or through your failures at all. He looks at you as a potential champion of God. Now, when God called me, he says, Carrie, I'm going to call you to an unusual type of ministry. Of course, it's him calling us, not us making ourselves that way. And I said, what is that, Lord? And he says, I'm going to call you to mature people in a, in a very powerful way and cause them either to grow up or run away. And if you think about it, that's over in Peter where the Bible says, for some, the word of God becomes a rock of stumbling and a stone of offense to those that stumble at the word. In Isaiah 28, it tells us that, that the word of God comes to us like water watering the earth, like snow that comes down and produces the bud. Then it shall, it, God's word will not return unto him void or without any fruit, but it shall accomplish in the thing where he sent it. Everyone say, I am the thing where God sends his word. So er evidently, God wants us to accomplish some of God's things, some of the original things he's planned and purposed for us. Do you know what they are? And if you don't, pursue God and let him reveal them to you. It says in John 16 that the Holy Spirit, when he comes, and he's here, he will guide us into all truth. Into is the future. Guide us into all truth. There is one thing Satan doesn't know. Well, qu quite a few things. That's the truth. Now, he knows part of the truth, but here's what he doesn't know. He doesn't know your future. He doesn't know what God can do through you. He can only guess by your past habits and the rhythms that you've done in your past since you were young. Remember, part of them, he's stuck in there. But now we're not of the old man, but we're of the new man. Can you see amen? New creatures in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. That's within our spirit and our focus. And all things in Christ have become what? New. So say I'm brand new. So transforming in the power of prayer, okay? So blessings to you, church family. Today we're going to reveal more about the power of prayer in our lives. The ability to produce and to pray correctly. Now, believe me, God hears all prayers, whether you feel they're correct or not. So don't get discouraged. But there are special ways in which to pray that God requires us so that it gets the, the most effectual result. Can you say amen? The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes or avails very much. So that's you. Say, that's me. So we want to teach you how to lob grenades into the Satan's camp from the throne room of God. You see, we're not like Daniel in the Old Testament, chapter 10, where he prayed and took 21 days for the angel to return the answer. No, we're in the New Testament. Everybody say New Testament. So when you say, Father, in Jesus' name, it punches not only through, but it punches its way back. There's no wrestling with principalities and powers hindering the prayers. This is not Old Testament. Remember, in the Old Testament, Adam gave the earth to the enemy. In the New Testament, Jesus came. That's why he's called the second Adam or the last Adam. He came and got it back. And then he says, you and I are going to work together. Can you say amen? How many here know that we're in a partnership with God? Do you believe you're in a partnership with God? Don't get out ahead of him. Stay right behind him. Follow him very closely. Study Elisha and Elisha. Okay? Study the prophet Elijah and his understudy Elisha. Watch how they followed each other. Watch what they did. The places they stopped. 
They stopped at Bethel, house of the Lord. They stopped at Jericho. Huh? They stopped at the last place. What was the last place? The Jordan River. Do you know what Jordan means? Ascending, descending of the Lord. <laughs> anyway, there's a lot of parables in there. We need to follow Jesus just like that. Say amen. Learn his ways. Learn how to talk like him. And that's not King James, the earth, valeth. No, it's talking like Jesus. Because in his voice and in his word, there is no guile. There isn't anything that he can be accused of. And may we have the ability to talk like that. What does it say in James? James says, if no man offend in word, that man is a mature or perfect man, able to control his whole life. Did you know your tongue can control your life or destroy your life? Sure, death and life are in the power of the tongue. All right, so let's go on a little further. Now, in the book of James, we, he says, we have not because we ask not. Don't ever forget that God needs us to invite him in. He gave the earth to mankind again, but if we don't invite God in, he just stays. Now, let us ask and receive. Let us seek after, and we shall find. Let us be diligently to knock, and God shall what? Open the door to us. But you know, I think, and maybe you can kind of agree with me or not, that the enemy's got the church so busy with the affairs of this life, and fighting their battles, and doing all that, they're not knocking anymore for God to open up some of the mysteries and treasures. They're not seeking anymore. Why? Because the enemy's got their concentration on problems. Now think about them. He's a master con. Here's you got the church, almighty God, focus on everybody else's situation. No, 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 no. Look up, God's been telling us. Look up. Why? He's about ready to return. He said there'll be signs in the heavens, signs on the earth, signs under the earth. We've got a great big eclipse happen. To, is it tomorrow? Yeah. That's just a sign to the world and to the United States. Hey, straighten up, unsaved people. But for the saved, this is a rejoicing. This is a means for us to share the gospel. Can you say amen? It crosses right over in the middle of the United States in a place called the rapture. Anyway, we have the clip for you, and if you want it, just... Give us a little note here on the broadcast, and uh, that little note will let us know to send you the clip if we can, all right? Are you ready to get into this? We're going to cover, we're going to read this in a minute, but cover these four areas, and let's read our paragraph. We're going to cover, number one, why we present ourselves to God, why we do it. Okay, two, this kind comes out by fasting and prayer. Folks, what kind comes out by fasting and prayer? Three, God's plan birthed in prayer. The Bible says, whatsoever is born of God, not whosoever, whatsoever. That means visions and plans and ministries that come from heaven to you and you birth them forth in prayer. Wonderful. You got a house you're claiming? Birth it forth in prayer. You got a business, you need to relocate, you got things coming, birth it forth in prayer. This is the prayer that goes out three or four months. And you birth things way out ahead. You put a little package, you write a little down, and you start praying over it, and you give it birth. Why? Because the vision came from God. Whatever is of God overcometh the world. So we're to bring God on earth. We're to bring heaven to earth. Heaven is here on earth, but we're to spread it around. The kingdom of God has come. It says, from my hand to your hand, from my mouth to your ears, let's get saved. All right. And finally, the fourth thing, the power of agreement in prayer. So again, why we present ourselves to God this kind comes out by fasting and prayer too. God's plan, or God's plan birthed in prayer and forth the power of agreement in prayer. You ready? Let's read our paragraph. Woo! Don't preach myself happy. 
All right, so this is Luke 21, 34 through 36. But take heed, that means really pay attention to yourselves. Now, he's not focusing on the flesh. Watch your walk, he's saying. Lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and the cares of this life. Now, I'm not worried about you about being drunken or carousing around, because I know you don't do that. But the cares of this life is really sneaky. That means the worries and the anxieties because your eyes slip from heaven down on yourself. Why didn't I get this? How come I don't got this? And the cares of this life do, and that day come upon you unexpectedly. The day might come on us unexpectedly. I, don't, I think God gives the church plenty of warning, don't you? I think he gives his children plenty of warning. Just like somebody coming over to your house, I call first. <laughs> God gives, gives to his church warning. He gives the world, you know, warning in a different way. The day come upon you unexpectedly, 35, for if it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch, therefore. What are we to do? Okay. And pray. Watch and pray. So if you haven't developed a good, strong prayer life, please do. Because it says, watch and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. In other words, get born again. Make sure you're right with God so that it doesn't matter when he comes, you go. Say amen. You're counted worthy. We see what the enemy's doing. He's telling people, oh, you know, God's not going to rapture us. We're going to go through the tribulation. You know something? This is how crazy people are. Number one, how many here know their father? How many know his capabilities? How many not? How many here know your heavenly father? Is he capable of turning hell loose on you? He's not capable of doing that. Because who lives in you? Now listen to me carefully. God lives in you. So he'd be turning hell loose on himself. He'd be a God abuser. <laughs> now, in the Old Testament, he had to do things because the people that were in the Old Testament up to Noah's time were not human. They were offsprings of fallen angel and the bipedal creatures that were going on in the earth. We'll go into that some other time during lunch. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? Okay? And so this whole entire scenario here, God is setting up the whole system. Are you ready? So guess what? We don't have to be concerned of when he's going to come because he's in us, isn't he? Now, don't you think that if God's going to send his son into the clouds to gather us, don't you think something's going to go off in your spirit? Yeah, it says there'll be a quickening. Now, when God gets ready to move in your life, isn't there a, isn't there a kind of a quickening? Can you imagine what that quickening is going to be like just before Jesus calls us home? Now, going back to our Heavenly Father, the reason why our Father is not a child abuser, okay, is because He's perfect. Say, my God is perfect. His ways to me are perfect. I mess it up. Okay. Because we can do a good thing, maybe the wrong timing or the wrong way. We don't mean that. It's the human mess up part. Recognize right away, we bring God in. More God, less us. More God, less us. Anyway, so our Father is not going to put us in with the devil's bunch. And there are people who teach this. They do. I wonder, now please don't get me mad. Don't get me wrong. I don't want you mad at me. I wonder if they really know God very well. Because the closer you get to God, you know he's incapable of harming you. We harm ourselves. We bring harm on ourselves. We do harmful things. But it isn't God bringing the harm on us. Well, well, what about the Old Testament? They brought the harm on them. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So you need to understand in the New Testament, God is promoting his children. There will be times in your life, though, you'll have blockages about attitudes and things of the old man. God will bring you right up to that growth. Remember, we're growing from the inside out. So we'll come right up to a blockage. 
Maybe it's a fear of something. Maybe you're afraid to be successful. Some people are afraid to succeed. So they always stay poor all their life. It's easier. <laughs> Whatever the reason. We got these mental blockages. And if God doesn't wash them out, they become strongholds. Can you say, oh no. Yes. They become strongholds. So some people are bound by fear because they've entertained it for such a long time. So whenever they're brought to a place where God wants to bring them past fear and into more love, they, they resist. The old man rises up a little bit, and the stronghold has to be brought down. Can you say amen? And so you'll get to know that as you go and to develop, you'll still come up inside of yourself, things that you're a little afraid of, things you're not, wonder, you wonder about. That's okay. God's pushing through and making you whole from the inside out. Say amen. All right. So you ready? Shall we go to point number one? Why we present ourselves to God. Psalms, will you go with me to Psalm 63, verse 1. Gosh, you're fun to teach. You're hungry. Listen what the psalmist says. David says, oh God, you are my God. That's a wonderful statement. Get up in the morning and say, God, ah, you are my God. Just a wonderful proclamation. Early will I what? There's the key, early. You don't want the enemy in between you and God starting off in the morning. What do you mean by that? I present myself right away to God so that my mind will go off somewhere thinking about things without presenting to God. Why? Because he takes my mind and he rests it and allows my mind to think good and pleasant. Some people have nightmares that get up in the morning and start worrying about things. Present yourself to God. That cuts that out of there. It's supposed to cut that out of there. Early will I what? Seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh brings or or longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there's no water. He's talking about walking in without God. Psalms what? Psalms 92, verse 1 and 2. It says, it is good to give thanks to God. Can you say amen? Thanks to the Lord. And to sing praises to your name, O Most High. Two. To declare your loving kindness in the morning. There you go. You got to look how many morning things are there. In the morning. And your faithfulness every night. You see, I have a little thing I do. In the morning, I greet God, present, uh, greet God and I present myself. Ask God for a cleansing and adjustment. It only takes about five to ten minutes. Now, I stay a whole hour, but I'm not asking you to. Present yourself to God, ask him to cleanse you, wash you, straighten out anything that might be out of the way or disjointed, help you get in harmony and tune, and now you're a fine running machine. We know that our car needs to tune up once in a while. How much more don't we? Okay? So I always go to God immediately to stay filled up, stay checked up, keep myself adjusted. Can you say amen? I'm in God's hand. If I make a habit of that with my heart, not with my head or a mindless practice, but with my heart, he, every time I meet with him, even if it's just a few minutes, I'm changed. I'm changed. You can't meet with God and not be changed. The problem is we don't notice it because maybe it's so minute. So that's not a put down. So we go to God, we present ourselves to God, we ask him to adjust us, cleanse us, refresh us, renew us, give us a focus for the day, and then we lift our hands, worship just a little bit, and then just go out. And then during the day, stay instant in prayer. In other words, if you see some, oh Lord, take care of that, Lord. I don't know what's going on. When I see a lot of times ambulances or I see some first responders going, I say, Lord, go with those that are going to help. Be with those that are needing help. Match them up. Go in the middle of them and get them where they need to be. And after you do it a while, it just becomes a natural thing. So you'll be dry. if you ever ride along with my wife and I and we're going somewhere together or something and you see an ambulance, you're just going to hear us go through that. Because we know we have to invite God in because maybe they didn't know to. You see, we're watchmen. Everyone say I'm a watchman. 
watching out for others to pray for them. God anointed you, Peggy, and you, BJ, to see things. And not everything you're going to see is positive. You're going to see some negatives. Why? So you can bring God into the situation to make up where it's failing. Someone say, amen. You see me failing in an area. Maybe I'm saying things you might not quite agree. Instead of attacking me or drawing away, pray for me. Bring God in. Say, Lord, if he's missing it in the area, just bless him and show him. Boy, I, I want your prayers. Hello? You see, when I pray, there's no aggressive meanness in it. You see, even concerning the devil, I don't have to be mean and rail on the devil. Please pay attention. Even Michael the archangel never railed on Satan. No, you release Jesus on him. Imagine, how many here been to Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and seen a thing called a slug? Some of those big banana slugs, man, they look like... <laughs> we used to step on them by accident when we were kids. And it was hard to wash it off your feet. But what takes care of a slug? Salt. You just put a little salt on the slug, man, and he's done. You're the salt of the earth. And you know what the devil's got you doing? Seeing everybody's faults, looking at all this, caught up into what you're doing. And you're not salting the slug. So guess what? He's moving slowly, trying to get into the family, trying to get into these things. Don't assume. Just make sure there's enough salt around your family, around your loved ones. So if he tracks on it, he'll either reverse or he'll get zapped. How many like that analogy? I hope we can get a short out of that. <laughs> Amen. Salt the slug. We are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its purpose or saltiness, it's good for nothing. Now, Jesus is talking about our worth. How many know that your worth is very, very valuable to God? Your worth is immense to God. Well, whether or not we yield and surrender ourselves to God and, and how we do that makes our worth more because then God can use us. Sometimes he only uses people a little bit because that's all they will give him. Other people let them lose them a little more because they give them more. We have to learn every day to surrender to God so he continues to use us, fill us with joy, good things. Can you say amen? Because he's the maintainer of our life. It says he who believes that Jesus is the son of God keeps himself into God's hands and is a wicked one touches him not. I think it's 1 John chapter 3. All right, so... We've seen the two scriptures in the morning, so I'm going to give you a few points. Number one, church, the only way out of this planet is through the Lord Jesus Christ. But to ensure our salvation, it's better for us to walk with him and not have such a bumpy road. Can you say amen? I, I only have a couple of meetings I'm with you a week. Make them. Make them. Because you want to spend as much time with somebody who has the seasons and teachings of the word that we're going to help you. See, when I go to sit down at a meal, I don't go because the plates are pretty. I don't go because there's nice, you know, garden music in the background. No, I go to feed my hunger. When we come to God, when we go to church, when we find Bible study, you go to feed the hunger of your soul. Can you say amen? And you want as much of that as you can. Well, I can read that by myself. No, you forgot the part where it says God put apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip you. If you could equip yourself, he wouldn't have that in there. But some people somehow do get equipped, bless God. I seen one one time. Pastor Kenneth Hagin, Brother Kenneth Hagin, bless his heart. He talks about this one guy who couldn't read or write. But he heard and watched preachers since he was a little boy. And his favorite preacher used to spit on his hands and anoint people's eyes. And they would get healed just about every time. And so as he grew up, he could only exercise on that which he's seen, not which he could read or study. So he studied all that, and he, he just started... I know what I'm going to do. You need healing? <laughs> Come on up. He didn't know any better, but you know what? When the people came up and he spit on his hands and 
anointed them, they were healed. He had faith in what he knew. Many Christians today, they know about God. They think they know where they're going. But you can't really have strong faith in that. You've got to get closer to God so he can build that foundation under our feet so we're more assured. So our faith just flows out of us. Say amen. What pleases God? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he's right there with them right now. And he's a rewarder of those who constantly, diligently go after it, seek him. And that's from the enemy gets us caught up, it slows us down. And we meet with God. And I used to do this when I first got saved. I only came to God when I had a problem. It's quiet in here. We go to God when we have problems, say amen. But what, try going to him without a problem. Say, Lord, I want to know what you got for me. Make a friendship. Go after God in a friendly way. He that desires friends must show himself to be friendly. If you want God to befriend you, be friendly. Don't always be irritated and upset all the time. He has to wait till you're done. Moving right along. Two, why, Pastor Kerry, why do we need to know this? Why do we need to present ourselves? Because in his presence, that's where we're washed. That's where we're adjusted. That's why, how we get filled. That's where we're clothed. I'm not talking about the armor. The armor is always on you. But you're clothed in a conditioning and this is to maintain the victorious walk every day. I believe God gave us victory. We should walk in it, say amen. But in order to do that, we've got to settle down. You can't sit on the top of an automobile going 60 miles an hour and not expect to get hurt. You can't be doing things on your own and expect God to bless it all the time. Sometimes we get out of protection and right out there where the enemy's dome is. I get up in the morning and say, Lord, what do you have for me today? He might only have one thing. He says, the rest of the time, have fun. Do you see any danger, Father God, ahead of me during this day? Any areas or traps? Let me know. You see, he knows all of it. But we never really kind of talk to God that way. I think he's got, the, the enemy's got us religious. Oh, God, if thou knowest my future, help me along the way, if it be your will. Now, that's ridiculous. But there are people who, with all their heart, believe and pray that way. The devil's a deceiver, deceiving us out of what we have, who we are, and, and what we can do through Christ. Isn't that an amen, Pauline? You can do all things through Christ that strengthens you. Say amen. The problem is we have to learn to flow with him. It takes a little bit of time. you got to get in rhythm. How many of you ever went dancing? And the first time you went, it was kind of like a couple of chimpanzees bouncing all over the floor. You might laugh with me. Then after the second time you went dancing, I'm talking about people that just dance. We're not talking about world sin. Dancing. You have to have a rhythm in dancing. And if you waltz with a partnership, someday I'd like to have my lovely wife up here while we're worshiping and I do... Worship God and waltz before the Lord. Now, I'm not encouraging anybody who's not married to do that, but I'm just simply saying God's into the dance. If you don't believe me, read Psalms 149, 150, amen, talks about making a joyful noise, singing and dancing and rejoicing. If you ever watch the Jewish people, they were taught to rejoice because rejoicing helped them get their eyes of the sorrow and the pain and the suffering. So they came up with songs and dancing to get the focus up. Can you say amen? God wants us to be merry in our heart. A merry heart does good like a, the joy of the Lord is my. That's right. Okay. Now I want to give you one more thing. If the angels of God, all of them by the way, if they have to present themselves to God, we who are a lesser creature more in God's image than they, but lesser creature but were crowned with great honor and glory, according to Hebrews, we should present ourselves. 
And that's the problem. When Adam and Eve, listen, listen careful. When Adam and Eve sinned, what was the thing they did? Did they go to God and say, oh man, we sinned? And God would have took right care of it. They hid themselves. They made excuses. They blamed God. He blamed his wife and God. Hello? They started trying to save themselves by sewing their own clothes on them. Now you can go in your own life. Are you doing your own thing too much? Think about that. Let God in. You know, God enjoys being with you. He dwells in your heart. Remember, I'm convinced. I'm going to say this right off. I'm convinced a lot of Christians listen, but only lightly. They hear it. They, they know in their heart. Now, listen to me. I'm not picking on anyone. I just want you to check yourself with this. I've heard many times my dad say certain things. I know what he meant, but I sort of breezed over it. Are we that way when it comes to the word or preaching or teaching? Do we say, oh, yeah, I know, I've heard that. You know, do we sort of breathe, or breathe over it? Now, listen, I'm not picking on us. I'm trying to say, have we missed something by doing that? Could up. You know, God never wastes a word on us. And believe it or not, you want to pray for your pastor, Carrie, or any other pastor that you might have, that they speak the word, the pure word of God, as much as they can, and not put my opinions in it, not put my, you notice I don't put my issues in it. I have a lot of things I'm against. But you don't hear me preach things that I'm against because it divides the body of Christ. That might be like me picking my ba favorite baseball team and says, if anybody else don't like that team, well, I'm going to pray for you. You see, that's what religion does. It breaks everybody up. No, we're all brothers and sisters. We're united in prayer. We can do a lot of things in united being in prayer. You might find something you don't agree with me, but instead of bringing it up, dwelling on it, find what you can and let's be united. Do you see the enemy's crafty? He split all the body of Christ up. Now God is bringing everybody back home to prayer. People are calling me up and saying, did you hear God saying? I said, yeah, what's God been telling you? He wants us to come and pray. I said, yeah, I've been giving us that message for five years. What? Whoever's listening. Have you ever had your dad or mom, maybe my dad or mom, my mom had some set of vocal cords on her, and when it was time for dinner, Carrie! You could hear it a whole block away. And I knew I better go. But how many times have we been called and we just didn't do anything? We just kind of waited, kept waiting. I'm telling you, the hour is and is upon us. That God is calling all to prayer, all to meet with them so he can fine-tune your walk and make you very effective in these end times because he's going to be coming splitting the clouds pretty soon. I hope you are ready. You can be ready by accepting Jesus Christ into your, as your Lord and Savior into your heart and then walk with him. He'll walk us out of here. God bless you. Now, let's go on to point two. Everyone say point two. All right, so as you go to point two, I'm going to read Job. Remember, this is when the angels came in and presented themselves in Job chapter one, verse six, also in, in chapter two. And who came in amongst the angels? Satan did. Sure he did. Now, folks, there's a lot of meat here in this little phrase. I don't want to cover it all. We'll be here all week. I thought God threw Satan out of heaven. How did he get back th up there? He took it from Adam and got back up into God's presence in Adam. Look what he says to God. So now was a day when the sons of God, ben he elohim ben he I got to say it, ben ha elohim sons of God, not Elohim. Okay, there's people out there, all the Elohim the same. No, they're not. They're sons of the Elohim, okay? When the sons of God presented themselves, those are angels, uh, uh, before God, okay? And Satan came in amongst them on Adam's authority. He stole it from Adam, came back into heaven after God threw him out. 
the nerve of him. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth in it. Who's dictating the earth now? Satan is. How did he get back into heaven? He came back in on Adam and Eve's authority. Remember, Adam could fellowship with God at Eve before they sinned without any limitations. I imagine them being with God even in the heavens if they wanted to. Now Satan has Adam's authority, walks back in and shakes his fist. And God says, where'd you come from? From walking back and forth in the e in the earth where Adam gave me. Now you know why we need to pray? You see, he's encamped in our atmosphere. He's encamped in the earth through people. And he's encamped under the earth. And he... I don't want to go into detail. That's another thing for lunch. But I'm telling you, Jesus, whose name is above every name of things in heaven, things on the earth, things under the earth. You see, Jesus took care of all of that, stripped them. Now what is the devil doing? He's hiding out, waiting for somebody to call him in. Hello? Because the word of God is not being preached. People are looking for the supernatural some other way. They're actually reaching in the darkness and pulling spooks out. You know what we need to be doing? We need to be seeing what's going wrong with so-and-so. Say maybe John, John Doe, he's got an anger problem. So I would say, John Doe, I claim his salvation. I, I arrest those demons in the name of Jesus. I remove their assignments. I place John Doe on your altar for his salvation. I, I release him to you, Lord. And those demons right now, I put them back behind the curtain, and I bind them there. And they can't come back. So guess what? Suddenly... John Doe wakes up, but he's no longer an angry man. We don't learn to fight that way. Our job, if you can imagine some little scabby little thing, and you got a hold of it in the name of Jesus. hope this is going good on the camera. And then there's a curtain right here, a curtain of God, and you just go, boom, in Jesus' name, and drop them off back there. Say amen, somebody. Why aren't we doing that? Do you notice when Jesus said to go into all the world, first thing he said to do is what? <clears throat> Cast out devils. Why? Because they're encamped. When we came and got this place by God, God delivered this place. We walked over, we bound all the devils, we bound all of the influences that had been here through the many years. We bound it all up and cast it out. Then we spoke in tongues and prayed, built our spirit up, and then we released the anointing in the property. And the ladies are releasing it more and more. Keep it up. Thank you. Amen. You see, we call heaven to earth. We bring heaven to earth. We bring healing to you. How do we do that? Through prayer, through speaking the word, through worship, through praise. Our job is to bring heaven and release it in the earth. Now, we know the heaven came. We know that the kingdom of heaven came. Can you say amen? We know the Holy Spirit came. But the Holy Spirit needs us to open up, believe, and draw him in. I stand at the door and knock. If you don't open the door and invite me in, then you got me out. Now, all of you have Jesus in your heart. But how about your family? Do you have a list of them? Do you write them in? I invite you into so-and-so. I invite you in there. I bind the demons. I keep them from... Do you start going. Be intricate. I mean, what else are you doing? Be strategic. Calculative. Say amen. I'll go back to the hand grenade. You and I pray from heaven. Is there any devils up there? Anybody up there resisting our prayer? In heaven and the throne of God? No. He needs us to enact the covenant by speaking his word. When we speak his word, it becomes a flaming sword. Much like the sword of the cherubim that pushed Adam and Eve out of the garden. It's a flaming sword of war. When we speak the word of God against the enemy, 
It's the word that fries him, not you. So learn to detach yourself from the word when you speak it against the enemy. Why, Pastor Kerry? Because if you don't detach yourself, there'll be a backslap. We don't want you to get backslapped. And some Christians, they'll be fighting and they'll warn and fighting. And they'll go on for several weeks doing this with their family and everything. And guess what? They only get a little bit of rest. They, don't, they have the armor on, but they don't get rejuvenated and everything. So what happens? The enemy has a counterattack. He tries to mount up. Well, if you know he's going to try to do that, happy are you if you dwell in the house of the Lord, that you dwell in God's presence. There's no way he can get in there. But we don't do that. We go to the house to get refreshed. Well, we haven't been there for a week. We go daily to the presence in the house of the Lord. Just remember house, presence, presence, house. Basically, that's where the presence of the Lord is. Go in into the presence of God. Get a good dose of the Holy Ghost every day. Say amen. Oh, can we move to point two? All right. So this kind comes out by prayer and fasting. Now, go with me to Matthew 17. This is going to be a beautiful, beautiful one for you. Jesus, when he showed me this, I just about came unglued. Jesus answered and said to them, remember the disciples? They were anointed to go cast out devils, you know, and lay hands on the sick, right? And they came back to this boy, and the, the boy had a spirit that threw him down and into the fire, and they went to cast him out, but they couldn't cast him out. So the, the father came to Jesus. I went to your disciples. They can't. I'm just telling you that prelude story. And, and now Jesus is going to answer them. We pick up right there. And then Jesus answered and said, Oh, faithless, gener faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon. And it came out of him. And the child was cured, listen, from that very hour. See, he wasn't cured instantly. It took an hour for the process to continue on. So get your eyes off of the results. <laughs> Say amen. Put it back on Jesus. See, if you pray for healing, you believe you received, don't look for the healing. You're being deceived. Now you're going by your eyes, not your faith. Bing. Helps me all the time to go review that point. Let's go on. Look at this. Look at this. And Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. Why couldn't they cast it? So in the 19, the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why couldn't we cast it out? It worked before. So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. For assuredly, I say unto you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, just a little teeny bit, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. Everyone say amen. amen. What was the problem, though? I'll tell you later. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now, the first thing we think about, Pauline, is the demon doesn't come out. This demon is so tough, it doesn't come out unless you fast and pray. That's not what Jesus is saying. Why couldn't the disciples cast the devil out? Unbelief. Boy, you guys, follow me here. If you're missing. It wasn't the demon. See, demons come out in the name of Jesus. You don't tell the demon, I'll be back tomorrow. I'm going to go fast and pray. They come out right away in the name of Jesus. But what blocks that is our unbelief. What Jesus is talking about is your unbelief comes out through fasting and prayer. Have you found that? that no, listen, i got to be careful. Read Isaiah 58, the latter part of it. But basically, you'll find that sometimes we just get real negative, just down and out. just seems like everything we say is negative. You need to fast a little because your flesh has taken over. All unbelief, listen, all unbelief, this is a good one, all unbelief comes from the flesh and some of the mind, but it does not come from our spirit. Who lives in our spirit? Yeah, he doesn't have any unbelief. The reason why people move from faith to unbelief is they move from the spirit realm into their physical, natural realm again. 
In your natural realm, you can do anything. But please God. He that's in the flesh cannot please God, it says. So we try to stay out of the flesh by presenting ourselves to God. And then when we believe. So Jesus said to his disciples, you came to me. How come we couldn't cast them out? Jesus says, your unbelief comes out because you don't fast enough and you don't pray enough. Hello? Yeah. Prayer builds you up spiritually while fasting rips your flesh out of the way. Next time you want to crave a steak and you found your life has been, you're sleeping through sermons and you're kind of listless, you need to fast. And listen, if you are going without to lose weight, declare a fast. Don't just lose weight. If you're going to go lose weight, I'm going to try to drop 10 pounds by the end of the month. Father, I declare a fast. Help me with that. And I do it for so-and-so's life. Now when, you, when you'll lose the 10 pounds quickly, won't be any stress. Why? Because you did it for the right reason and not for your selfish. Want to lose some pounds. See, that's worth a million bucks for you. Back when I was overweight, I used to, when I call, I, you know, try to lose weight, you know. Try, listen, if you're really overweight, you need to lose, drop about 40 pounds a month. That's really hard to do. And the older we get, the harder it is. I hate to even say anything like that because every bit of our metabolism slow down. There's no magic pill, you know. There's no magic drug will do that without affecting your body. But if you let God in on your life and you want to lose, declare fast, and let God step in and help you along the way, you'll find out you'll lose weight. But do what he asks you to do. He might ask you to exercise. Lord, I want to lose weight, but don't ask me to exercise. Don't ask me to help you lose weight. You have to do what's required. So when you exercise, he'll help you exercise. See, we always think we're going to do it without God. See, that's the problem. You did. How'd that work out for you, Bunky? Hello? Doesn't work out very good. Come on, laugh with me. All right, so everybody say, I got it. So in order to get unbelief, in order to get things changed, and you find that you've been praying, but things don't seem to move a little, declare a fast before the Lord on behalf of God, on behalf of such and such, or this project, or that situation, and bring it before the Lord as a package, lay it at his altar, and say, Father, help me through this. Let's do it in Jesus' name. Jesus led a fasted life. The reason why he could, could cast the devil out of people in a drop of the hat, and the only reason I can, is I live a fasted life. I don't live to eat. I eat to live. I never used to do that. I used to just love to eat, cook, and everything like that. But you know what? I want to stay on the planet long enough so I can help somebody. Amen. All right, so let's go on to the third point. Everyone say third point. God's plan, birth, and prayer. Now, folks, when you got saved, Satan couldn't do a thing. Supernaturally, you asked Jesus to come into your life, forgive you of your sin, supernaturally in the spirit he could not stop that he could try to distract you from doing it but he could not stop the initial flow well that's how God wants us to learn can you say amen that's how God wants us to have ministries and do things he wants us to hear from him and remember the devil isn't hearing this you hear from him and then start praying about it for example we need a full children's church Lord, start bringing in, start birthing in a children's church. You know what area it is to minister. Lord, we need an evangelism system that will go out into our neighborhood. Lord, see, he gives the idea to us in the spirit. Let us not be so foolish to share the idea so much the devil picks up on it. No, you take it immediately to prayer. And pray about it. In prayer, you, it builds in you like a baby in the womb. You start building in it that new house, that property, Lord, that new business, the change in my business. You start praying for it, and it starts growing and birthing and growing and birthing. God says, I can hear you. Lord, add this and whatever. Go right on in and add to areas I don't know to ask you. And you see you're birthing it forth. Can you say amen? How many people in here 
prayed for your family and that family member got saved. You birthed them. You help bring God in on them. See, when I pray, when you pray, we bring God in on their behalf. And we bring them before God. Can you say amen? It's like when I got up in this morning. I got up with God and I got up in God. You see, I see an in God believer here. I see in God believers. Can you say amen? You're a new creature in Christ. So that's why I don't play mind games with you and I don't fiddle with your flesh. I just tell you the truth. That's my way of loving you. Some would say, oh, me. <laughs> amen. So can you say amen? So God gives you vision. He gave me a vision of the ministry that I would be in, in my spirit. But did I have to pray about Oh, yes. Now, when Jesus was ready to pick his disciples, what was he doing? He went to first to prayer so he could get his Father's will on it. Didn't Jesus know everything? You see, you keep realizing that Jesus wasn't a... You try to make him Jesus all the time. He's a human being doing what we have to do, talk to his Father, get the Father's wisdom. Did you know? Here's something for you. When you read the book of Revelation and you read the first chapter, did you know that Jesus didn't know at one time how he was going to return? We know that the Father has only kept that in his power. He shared not with Jesus when he's going to return, correct? Neither the angels in heaven. Well, another thing, if you read the book of Revelation, the first chapter, he doesn't even tell Jesus until then when John gets the vision of what Jesus is going to come like. Jesus is many, many wonderful things. This time when he's going to come, he's going to come as king of kings and lord of lords. He's going to have fire, furnace, and fiery eyes, you see. And if you read it, it says this, the book of Revelation to his son, to John. God had to reveal it to Jesus first before he could reveal it to John. Here's going to happen this way. Jesus, go now. Good, Father. He tells Jesus first, and then we get to know. Can you say amen? You are so hooked up with God, you just got to realize it. All right, I didn't lose you on that little side journey, I hope. Okay, so God gives us a vision. We pray about it, it comes to pass. It's birthed. Hello. God tells you, you're going to be this way instead of jabbering about it. Go to prayer about it. Let God birth it. People who need healing, listen. You have to go to the scripture, pick out the scripture that shows you that by his stripes you are inequivocally already paid for as for your healing. You've got to begin to see yourself healed. So you go to God and you begin to pray. Lord, birth my healing. Birth this healing. And boy, I tell you, just like you're pregnant, you'll start churning and, and thing. Remember, you're keeping the devil out of this. And then you're talking to God, and God might say something like you. He said, I'd be love to heal you, but every time I do, you get negative and you talk about people. So when I go to heal you, it stops me, you see. So it's not so much God going to heal us as so much the healing is stopped. Hello? And I just described me. I had to believe for my own healing many times. Like the cyst on my hands, I had a big old cyst on my chest. Looked like I was, my heart was going to explode. Lay hands on it every day. You know what happened when I laid my hands on it, Peggy? Nothing that I could see. But each time I was doing it, I was releasing God in it. Okay? And it zapped each time. And all of a sudden, when my mind was off and I was thinking of something else, boof, it's gone. Same thing happened with my cyst. I was, it hurt so bad, it spread my wrist so wide, and big old knob, I don't know who I showed it or not, and so, and it hurt, and then one day it just really hurt, so I said, I'm going to have this thing photographed. I had already prayed and asked God to heal it, and I went and have it photographed just to see what's going on there. So I had him photograph it, and you know what he said to me? He says, I don't see any cyst. What had happened is the bones were shrinking back into my hand, and they hurt. 
and they would have been spread right out. You could have seen the difference. Some of it, you still can see the diff some of the difference. And you know, you have to learn to believe for things. Get your eyes up. And you know, we have to have the same disciplines of faith that everybody else has. Can you say amen? amen. All right, so therefore, when God gives you something, don't run around and brag about it. Pray about it. Let God start birthing it in you. Got a ministry. God, you feel God's laid on your heart? Don't tell everybody right away. People, some people can be very discouraging. Yeah, that's not for you, you dearie. It's how be it to me to keep you from what God wants in your life? Say amen. All right. So we birth things in prayer. Did that help you? Let's go to the last one. The power of agreement. Go with me to Matthew chapter 18, one of my favorite scriptures. Verse 18 through 20. Now, remember what I told you about when Jesus rose from the dead? He didn't struggle with the devil down in hell, did he? Jesus went down there to tell the people in prison, you're going home with me. And the people that, and the evil spirits and stuff that were bound there are going to stay because some really evil spirits are bound there. And he walked right over and took the keys of hell and death right out of Satan's hand. Satan's just, looked, just shrunk up. He's completely stripped, remember. Somehow we get this idea, he went down there, and him and the devil just duped it all out, and Jesus was down for the count, and one, two, you know. Nonsense. All that was done on the cross. When Jesus said, it is finished, everything was done. And he said it in faith, because Jesus still had to go over and get the keys, and he still had to lose those in Abraham or paradise, right? And, and set them free. Are you with me? Yeah. You know, but here on earth, what the enemy's done, he's, he's factioned and separated everybody from everybody so that we cannot join together in agreement. Hello? When's the last time you saw 13, 14 churches around here get together? We need to. He that knows to do it and doesn't do it, you're sinning. You're missing the mark. That's the sin that misses the mark. And you're doing that because you're doing your own thing. We need to get together. We need to stop focusing on our differences. We stop noticing what's wrong with someone else and forget that we've got a lot wrong with our own self. Don't we? Are we over-opinionated? Please don't be, because God, God will humble us. Exalt yourself, you'll, God will humble you. Humble yourself, God will exalt you. All right, you ready? So we found out how to birth God's plan. It says, let us come boldly before the, the throne of God where we can obtain mercy and find help in a time of need. Verse John 5, 4 and 5 tells us another scripture on birthing. All right, let's go to the last point. The power of agreement. Matthew 18, verse six, uh, 18. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth, bind means to tie up. Okay? When you bind something, you bind your ankle, you tie it up, you mend it up. Can you say amen? All right? In this case, it allows for chained and, and shackled up. Okay? Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose, release, or let go on earth will be let go in heaven. Now, most people don't understand. You and I function on God. Can you say amen? And God's got the power. Can you say amen? And so whenever we bind something, the power that's in heaven will bind whatever we bind. Make sure when you bind something, don't say, I bind this spirit on so-and-so. No. No. Here, you want to bind the spirit from so-and-so. From so-and-so. Not to so-and-so. And then command them to be loosened. Say loosened. Everyone say this with me. I bind in Jesus' name every foul spirit that works against my church, my pastor, my country, and I bind it. 
and I render it ineffective, and I put it behind the curtain, in Jesus' name, it has to stay, and I command it loosened. And if you say it with real authority, you'll feel things pop right out, and you go, whoa, what was that? You just presented yourself to God. God loves that. Look, my child's requiring my authority. Woo! Surely I say to you, whatever you bind on earth, whatever you loose on earth, is loose from heaven. I loose more reinforcement angels in these last days. Have you thought about doing that? Lord, bring more into the capital, clean that mess up. Bring more into our state, shut every abortion clinic in the name of Jesus. Every doctor that thinks about performing such a murder like that, you'll have such conviction on them. They'll fall down and cry out for God. Lord, I release that now in Jesus' name. You see, I'm a covenant person. I have covenant power. But it's God that does all of that through the words of our lips, the sword of the Spirit. The problem is, the church is so busy with their own problems. Oh, God, get me through this one. Our focus is dropped off of God. Now I'm making fun for a minute, not to make anybody feel bad. Our focus is off God, our captain, the one that leads us into victories and keeps us into victories, onto the problem like we're going to answer it. Little Tricky from Dickie, the devil. Now listen to this. Sure I say, if any two of you agree on earth, where are we? <laughs> As touching anything that they shall ask. So I go, you know, we have a project. We want to get this project done. Everybody stretch your head and hands and touch it in Jesus' name in the spirit. Start praying for it in the next couple of weeks and birth it up. Hello, now we're Figuring, we're bringing things out of Satan's resistance right into God's birthing. Can you say amen? And now we've got agreement. People that are agreeing with us on that same thing. And now one can put a thousand to flight, thousand demons. That's how powerful God is in one person. Now we get two people together and agree, 10,000 demons. Now if I get somebody else like Becky... Now there's three. That's 100,000 demons. You add one more, and that's a million demons. It keeps going up and up. But see, that's why it's hard to get two Christians to agree on anything. Look, I'm not asking you to agree with everything, but this is our, what we're going to do. I typed it all out. We're going to pray over this, and I want you to agree. This would be a good thing, a little strategy for you. How once in a while some projects like that get everybody slap their hands in agreement on it. Start using strategically little battle things. And remember, you have a lot of power at your disposal. Don't fall asleep on it. Can you say amen? And I'm referring to don't let the enemy just keep us from knowing the excellence of some of the tools we have. Say amen. Prayer of agreement. Do we have any examples, Pastor Kerry, of the prayer of agreement? We sure do. Do you guys remember in Acts chapter 4? It says, great persecution came onto the church. This is a, we'll have it probably up there. Do we have our notes up there? Okay. Great persecution in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 4, persecuting the church. And terrible things were happening. This is just before Ananias committed high treason and died because they come in against the church, Acts chapter 5. And here they got more bold. They got together, and they brought all these naked reports, and this is they're just, just same like that. We need to pray. And it says that all of them joined in one accord, in one prayer, and they lifted up their voices, and they asked God to intervene. That's called intercession. God, come and intervene and take care of all of them. Now, that's a huge amount of people. And it says the power of God entered in because of agreement. Entered in. That's what I want us to do in our worship and our togetherness is to focus on God while the time you're here. Not yourself, not the lunch, you know, not what you're doing 
I'm God, so you get everything. And when people are joined together like there's corporate power, and it says the place was shaking and was shooken up, and fear came on everyone, even those around the area. Get a chance to read Acts chapter 4, 24, then 29 through 31. Let's go with me to Acts chapter 16. Let's look at this one. This is Paul and Silas. Remember this? Paul and Silas were evangelists. They traveled together. They got in trouble together. I could see that Paul got himself all mixed up. They cast a devil out of a woman who was divining. How many here don't know what divination is? Is anybody? That's when you go to a tarot card reader or you want your fortune read it or your horoscope. That's divination. This is where lying spirits can come and lie to you. They can even show up in your bedroom looking like your dad or your mom. You don't want anything to do with them. Your mom or your dad are safe in heaven. They're not allowed to come visit you. You're not having a vision. You're having a demon visit you to try to lure you and attach to you so it can manipulate you. Say, oh, me. So they cast this out of this girl, and a whole bunch of people got saved. But the people that were using them make money in the carnival threw Paul and Silas in jail. And about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. What were they doing? And singing hymns to God. And then the prisoners were listening to them. Amazing grace ringing out all through the prison. They're all quiet. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loose. That means all the other prisoners. And the keeper of the prison awakening from sleep, he seen the prison doors that were open, supposing the prisoners are gone. He drew his sword. You see... The law is, if your prisoners get out on your watch, you're dead by morning. So he figures he's going to die. So he ends up wanting to kill himself, and Paul you know, tells him, hey, no, we're all safe. I'm just going to take it from here. We're all safe. But notice they were praying and praising God, and God intervened. God dwells in the praises of his people. They could have been complained. I could just imagine Silas looking at Paul and saying, Paul, here's another fine mass you got us into. We got thrown from here, cast out a devil. Now we're in prison. What are we going to do? You see, natural thinking. No, nope, they just said, we're going to pray and praise the Lord. Now, there's one more one I want to bring up, but I'll just talk about it, and then we'll get out of here. And that's Peter. Do you remember the story of Peter? Over in the 12th chapter, Remember, he was cast into prison. And much prayer and fasting went out for him, right? And it says at midnight, or it says in the dark time, that an angel of the Lord came in, and his chains dropped off of him, and the door opened, and he smote him on the side. Peter was really nervous about where he was going to die or not, because he was asleep. Woke him up, followed the angel out of the prison, and then the angel says, bye-bye, Peter. And, Peter. and Peter's rubbing his eyes, wondering if it's a dream or not. He's out of prison. Our God's very supernatural. But people were praying for Peter, amen? Now listen, this is a joke. The people that were praying for Peter, Rhoda and her bunch, they were praying for Peter to get loosed and everything like that. But do you know people can pray and not believe? Hello, some people can pray, but it's surface. They're not really believing. So here Peter shows up at the door of Rhoda's house. Hello, it's Peter, Peter. Everybody's going, it's got to be a devil or something. And Rhoda goes over there. She opens the door, and Peter's standing right there. And she goes, ah, slams the door right on his face. It's Peter's ghost. Why are we so ready to, to you know, and now uh, Peter knocks again. Hey, hey, let me in. You guys' prayers worked. 
Folks, your prayers work. Your job is to bring God in on others. Do you have a brother, a sister that needs to be saved? Have you got a family member? Maybe your father or your mother is having a struggle. Your job is to bring God on for them. It doesn't take but a moment. That's what the beauty of loving others through prayer is all about. Did you get something out of that this morning? Would you give the Lord praise?